Hello, everyone. This is uh, George Castandi, the moderator today, and I want to welcome you all to uh, Origin and Cause's fourth annual national tour. Every October for the past few years, we've been fortunate to travel all across the country from St. John's, Newfoundland to Victoria, BC, to meet you face to face and offer you some technical training and have an opportunity to shake your hand and thank you for your business. This year, not too many people are shaking hands, are they? And with the travel restrictions due to COVID-19, we decided we're, we're going to try this as a virtual event instead. So sit back, relax, take notes, and welcome to Origin and Causes National Tour Virtual Edition. So our next topic is structure fire incendiary investigations. I want to just go through a few things very quickly before I introduce the speakers. We're going to be doing a live Q&A at the end of, of this session, so please feel free to submit your questions via the text box under the webinar screen, um, and all questions will be addressed anonymously. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate and a follow-up email this coming in the next week. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to email the team at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. All right, let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mario Delorme. Mario is a fire and explosion investigator and is also the Eastern Canada Manager of Origin and Cause. He has over 35 years of industry experience and has conducted over 1,300 fire and explosion investigations. His technical background actually is in policing, uh, criminal investigations, and he also worked at the fire marshal's office. Welcome, Mario. Well, thank you, George, and welcome to everybody. And I just wanted oh, to, forgive me, Mario, just sorry. want to introduce Ian. Sorry. Uh, so, Ian, uh, we also have a second presenter, Mr. Ian Don, who is an international executive general adjuster at Crawford & Company. He is a fire and explosion investigator and has, has over 40 years of uh, uh, experience. His areas of expertise include building and construction, power and energy claims, commercial and industrial property claims, boiler and machinery, course of construction, and complex casualties. So I'll pass off the mic to Mario, who will get us uh, kickstart this, uh, this presentation. Well, thank you, George, and I'm sorry that I jumped the gun there. Perhaps, no, uh, <laughs> perhaps the uh, the coffee that I was having uh, just uh, got me started a little early. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Mario Delorme, and I'm the Eastern Canada Manager of Origin and Cause. Today, my segment is on incendiary fires, and I'm often asked when we're talking about incendiary fires, what's the difference when we call or we speak about incendiary fire and or an arson. There are subtle differences on both of them. The incendiary fire really speaks about the willful relating to the criminal setting on fire of property. As for arson, we often speak about the criminal act of deliberately setting fire to property or recklessly starting uh, a fire or explosion. So one of them really, the incendiary is the causal factor and the arson is more related as to the charge. Incendiary fires, when we're talking about the subject, we're looking at deliberately ignited and person knows the fire should be should not be ignited. So in this case, we're talking about mens rea and what we're really talking about is the state of mind. Mens rea is really the intention or knowledge of wrongdoing that constitute part of a crime. So, but before we go any further than this, when we investigate incendiary fires, we're really talking about our approach. And the approach to a fire scene from a fire investigator needs to be unbiased, meaning that we look at the scene for what the scene says to us. So we approach it with a systematic and methodical uh, approach uh, and a process of elimination. So once we gather our facts, we're able to render our, uh, our conclusion. But more so and more important is that motives are nice, but motives really don't fall under our category. And the reason for that is the fact that someone is selling their home or may have some financial problems or had an argument the night before, 
we put that aside and look for what the theme can offer us. However, I will go into some of the motives on my next slide that we obviously know. Financial motives, they'll often include the uh, the gambling. There could be gambling. I've had this in the past where somebody has gotten themselves debt, uh, deep in debt, where they actually at that point um, resource to setting their property on fire. There's also a loss of job, there's greed. Those are some of the uh, motives that can arise from the financial. Revenge is another one, sometimes landlord and tenant. I'm sure one or two of you have been lied to during your careers and uh, revenge between a landlord and a tenant can happen. Marital issues can happen as well. And not too long ago, I had one that was a little bit out of the ordinary where it was a new business that had established itself in an area where they had started taking business away from others. And uh, we found out eventually after a lengthy investigation by the police that a fire was set to the new business by somebody that was disgruntled that had been established in that market. We have mental health as well that uh, can arise, and especially now in these uncertain times with COVID-19, anxiety levels, the loss of job combined, um, you know, can render some of the people's uh, normal, habitual uh, ways of doing things and, and render them um, more unstable, if you wish, uh, and lead to these uh, these property crimes. There's also mischief. Um, we also know that people will set a fire to a dumpster fire, not realizing that it's too close to, to a building. And uh, the next thing that we know, we have large, large property damage, large losses. We also have serial arsonists. For those who may remember about 15 years ago in the Ottawa area, in the Winchester area, we had an arsonist going to uh, several barns for a period of several years. And uh, at one point, we were getting maybe one or two a month uh, that were being set. So those are also indicators. Now, on my next slide, we're going to talk about incendiary fire indicators. And those, those indicators can be anything from when we're doing an investigation to multiple fires, unusual file, fuel load or configuration, irregular fire patterns, burn injuries, lack of expected fuel load, incendiary devices, lack of expected ignition sources. But when we're looking at the why as well, we might be looking at occupancy. If a home is vacant, it may provide an opportunity. We may also look at, and I'm sure that uh, Mazin has spoken about this, conditions of doors and windows, and even the property, if it appears to be abandoned. We're all, we're really looking at a crime of opportunity at that point. And when we do investigations, it's important to look for disarmed alarm systems, sprinkler systems that may have been tampered with. So let's start with the first one, which is multiple fire indicators. Fires with no obvious connection among them. Well, multiple areas of origin can be described as two simultaneously burning fires that have no correlation. So you would have one in the basement and one, let's say, on the second floor. And there's no way to correlate these fires. So in doing so, what you're looking for really is again, doing your investigation in an unbiased, systematic and methodical approach to look to see, is this fire that started in the basement, did it go between the walls? Did it, was it radiant heat? And did it transfer to the other area? Once you've looked at this and you can eliminate this and start eliminating radiation, convection or conduction, or even germ suppression, sometimes you'll have a burning piece of combustible that is pushed into another room, this is what you want to look for, is that there's no way that these can correlate. And you want to make sure that the fire spread is not uh, as a result of the natural progression of the fire. Now, it's 
sometimes you can confuse a site from a previous fire. I'm not sure how many of you have dealt with that, but years ago, I've had a similar incident where I was in the Glebe investigating a fire, and it was the fire was actually in the attic area. But on the first floor, there was, during suppression, the fire department took down the uh, gypsum board and exposed a beam, a large wooden beam support that was charred. And I couldn't correlate either one of them. So what I did is I contacted the fire department to try and obtain a fire history of the structure. And I was told that approximately seven years before there had been a fire and it was an electrical fire in the ceiling level cavity. And at that point, it was easy to put the two and two together that they had nothing to do with it. And what had happened in this case, the beam had been sealed and the ceiling had been put over it and it was hidden. And when I spoke with the insured, the insured indicated to me that the uh, during the summer months, sometimes you could smell uh, just the faint odor of uh, smoke or something that had been burnt. So what we want to do is when we're at a scene is look at irregular fire patterns. So if you look at this carpet here, take a look at all of your surroundings and do you see anything in this that suggests that the fire came from any other areas? And when you look at the carpet, do you see any debris that suggests that you could have had an extension cord or anything on there that could have been a competent and potential ignition source. So let's continue with the irregular fire patterns. Combustible fuels or ignitable liquids, you know, are often used to spread the fire. In the case of the carpet that you've just seen, okay, that's exactly what had happened. And this home also had several other carpets at different levels that had the same type of patterns. Now, they also leave, you know, distinctive patterns on the horizontal surfaces such as floors, but I've also had where people have sort of sprinkled the, the gasoline along the walls where you will actually see sometimes on the vertical side, sort of a dripping kind of uh, pattern and a burn pattern on the walls. So don't just focus on the horizontal, but look as well on the vertical these things do happen. You want to determine that these patterns do not result from other mechanisms. And when we're talking about other mechanisms, you know, we can easily speak about the um, electrical failures, uh, whether it's permanent or non-permanent electrical devices, okay? You can talk about um, smoking, candles, cooking, sc spontaneous combustion, uh, even uh, lightning, but what materials can we use, okay, or can be used during incendiary fires? Well, just about anything really. We're looking at ignitable liquids, clothing, linen, paper, and straw. I mean, of course, there's all other kinds of combustibles that we can use, but for some reason, I've come across more toilet paper being used at fire scenes than anything else. And the reason I'm saying this is that um, I think some of the, the criminals are those that intend on setting the uh, fires to their property seem to have watched a lot of cartoons where they can unroll their, their paper towel or unroll their toilet paper, send it from one end to the other of the basement and ignite it one end and suspected that it will go right up the stairs and into the, the bedrooms, and that's not the case. Um, obviously, we know that we need to be able to sustain the flame, and there's all kinds of other issues that get involved, such as ventilation and uh, other fuel that can keep on burning long after we put the flame to a piece of paper. So in this case, if you look at this irregular fire pattern, what do you see? Well, you see a protected area and you see the floor next to this protected area that's been sustained heat damage, but it's just surface heat damage. When we look at the bed, we also see that there was a protected area there. The picture, because of the angle that I was taking it, but it actually continued all the way down the stairs with a protected area like that. So 
when the suspect poured the gasoline, they poured it on the surface and eventually, because there was no ventilation until the windows gave out, the fire died and you can see that everything is just surface burned. So when we look at irregular fire patterns, we need to make sure that we pay attention to um, where these protected areas are because often they'll tell us what was laying there. So when observable damage is inconsistent with the fuel load, you need to investigate it further. So in this case, we knew that we had something that was there. It was no longer and it had been removed. And in this case, it had been removed by the police. So this is something to pay attention to. And the absence of the fuel itself is not enough to classify it as incendiary. So sometimes you will have uh, an area in a corridor, stairway or hallway that where you don't have as much fuel load, but you will have a burn. You need to investigate this further. It could be spontaneous combustion. It could be a rag that has been left there. It could also involve anything from um, a uh, another product that uh, may have oxidized as well. It could also involve the fact that somebody has dropped a, a cigarette and there was paper there accidentally. So you need to make sure that you look into it in a lot more depth. You need to search the debris. And this is important because we have a tendency to look, for example, on the carpet that we saw several slides ago. And we'll look at the debris and assume that there's nothing there. But once you get on your hands and knees, your investigators when they're there, they will start looking to see if there's any small pieces. So the attitude is always should always be constant. Go further and look deeper to see what's there. You may need to take a sample. You might be looking for um, remnants of batteries. You may be looking for an extension cord that's running underneath, but these are the type of things that you wanna be looking into. Examine the burn area and its totality. And that's also crucial. I, years ago, I was at a scene where it had been shoveled out by the uh, Ontario Fire Marshal at the time. And they do a good job and they certainly go in depth, but there was a corner of the room in this case where uh, it hadn't been shoveled out. Uh, probably they'd had enough evidence with their samples and everything else that they had taken. But as I went a little further into that corner, I started to scrape the floor. And as I scraped the floor, I hit a piece of plastic. And once I scraped it again and flipped it over on the other side, the top portion was obviously darkened. But underneath was a color red with... Um, a five gallon number on it. So we knew that it was a gas can at that point. So always go a little bit further, make sure that it's completely examined. Look in areas such as the closets, the crawl spaces, the attics. We wanna make sure that your experts go in and open all of these. Sometimes people think that we're just trying to be snoopy or we're just trying to look into something that uh, to see what people have. But, you know, when we're going to be talking about incendiary devices, it's very easy to put a candle up in the closet and leave it there. People will shut the door and what happens? Well, you cut off the, the oxygen. And when you cut off the oxygen, at that point, the fire dies down. So this is why you want to go a little bit further and look into these places. So when we're talking about unusual fuel load configurations, we're often talking about, you know, taking furniture and combustibles and putting them in an area where it may not match. It's almost like a they're trying to set up a bonfire. I've had this in areas where you have in the middle of a living room, you'll have furniture stacked up and you'll have it piled up in the form of a, of a bonfire. And you go in there and it's easy to see that there's no other potential and competent ignition sources for that area. So, these are the type of things that when we're looking at incendiary fires, help us build our facts as we're going along. However, what we want to be careful is not to assume that unusual fuel loads are uh, related to a fire being deliberately set. There's people that may have had a party the night before, may have reconfigured their furniture. They're also maybe, uh, you know, the way I set up my furniture and you do may 
be completely different. Mine may not make much sense to you. So what we want to do is look, see what we have for competent and potential ignition sources for that area and why this furniture was there. So how do we do that? Well, before going into any scenes, it's important to get as much information as we can from the insured. If we can get a statement, and your statements are crucial, I rec highly recommend that if you're just writing down your statements that you can get them through audio. But if you're taking a statement for anybody out there that are your insured, you may want to give them a piece of paper and ask them to write where the furniture is or where the furniture is supposed to be. Uh, you may wish to have them indicate if there's any extension cords or anything else that's there, uh, batteries and so on, so that your process of elimination can lead you on the fact-finding mission. Okay, and the fuel type that's there are these cushions? Is they a leather couch? Are they wool? What do you have there? Is there any throwaway blankets? So, and this uh, leads me to my next point, which is people that often are involved in setting their fires can be injured. And what we want to do is analyze those injuries. You know, we want to ensure that are the injuries consistent with what you see. So if your exposure to the heat is through a radiation burns, chemical burns, electrical burns, you want to see if the injuries, you know, match what they were telling you at the time in their statement. Um, you want to determine the relationship to fire uh, ignition and your investigative hypothesis or hypotheses, depending on how many that you're looking at at the time and your process of elimination. You want to attempt to determine the type of burn injury. Sometimes, I think some of you have probably seen some of the videos that are out there. And if you want to have any of the videos, I have some that I can send to you. But on boiling liquids and cooking, you may have a pot full of oil. And what happens if you throw water on top of it? Well, you know that you usually get a flash of the, the fire, but the steam as well will deliver injuries to somebody that is consistent. You'll be able to see that on their faces and so on. If you have a drug lab, it might be completely different. You might lose a body part if there's an explosion or something like that. So those are the type of things that you want to do when you're an analyzing some of the uh, body injuries. So if there's body injuries and somebody is trying to delay the fire, then you'll probably have incendiary devices. Well, there's a wide range of mechanism for these, anywhere from candles, oil lamps, Molotov cocktails, matches, cigarettes, you know, even cooking, you know. But also, in uh, in a case that I had several years ago when I was still policing, there was um, a bar, and it was a remote operated device that was put up in the ceiling and this device was made so that it would heat up and there was a vial of a small glass vial in there with gasoline and once it would heat up and break it would actually start the fire and this was reconstructed and it was redone to show that this this was possible so the imagination is limitless when when you look at your scenes, it's important to recognize that there may be some incendiary devices there. And almost any appliance or heat producing device can also be used. You can put a space heater too close to combustibles. Um, they may also be altered so that they don't function properly. Most of the newer ones, if they're tipped over, they should be able to shut off. There's often a thermal cutoff where these uh, appliances will shut off, but sometimes they're bypassed. And, you know, it's important to get these examined, especially to put them in a lab and put them through x-rays if that's the case and if you need to do this. You know, these uh, the remains of devices in the debris can often be found. So you want to make, be, ensure that you go through that and you want to make sure that you obtain these, bag them properly and seal them. And some of the, uh, the constructed de delay devices allow the fire setter obviously plenty of time to leave the scene. And if you do find one, which is possible that it's been missed, and if you do find one, don't touch it. 
don't move it, leave it there. Sometimes they may be, you know, uh, set to go off. The other thing too is that you want to avoid contamination and you want to be able to avoid spoliation. And uh, Adam spoke about uh, spoliation issues. We want to make sure that, you know, we have security at our scenes. We want to make sure that we limit the people in the structure. And we want to make sure that when we seize these items, okay, that we ensure proper continuity and analysis. And we want to make sure that all the vested people with the vested interests can attend. Um, we want to inspect the building for multiple fires. And remember, we're talking about incendiary devices, so you may have them on different floors. Um, one particular case in Winchester, again, I seem to be coming back to Winchester, Ontario, but in Winchester, I had a an oil lamp that was placed behind a cushion on a couch. And much of the wick had been taken out and you could tell that it had been lit at one end. Well, it never made it to the oil lamp, but I was able to find other delayed ignition devices throughout the house. Some of them were in closets and I even found one in a desk drawer. So you want to make sure that if you find one, there's probably or there's likely that you may find another one as well. Uh, you want to examine these areas for the debris and that they may contain, um, for example, uh, ignitable liquids. And if they do, you want to make sure that the sample is taken and taken and sent to a proper lab. The methodology and consideration, well, that doesn't change, okay? It's the same residential and commercial. What we want to do is when we go to these scenes, we want our methodology to be the same. We don't want to alter, we want to stay unbiased. So therefore, when we look at these scenes, I prefer in my case not to have information that there, there's some financial issues going on or that um, there was some marital issues. I don't really want to know that. I want to provide you and our experts want to provide you with an unbiased report. We will let the scene speak for itself. We want to avoid contamination. So we understand that sometimes there's some emergency services that are to be done, especially coming this time of the year where pipes can freeze and there's all kinds of issues. But speak to your expert and get them in touch with the contractor. For some reason, there's a delay and please ensure the security. We can work with these, but we want to make sure if at all possible that your expert that's investigating the fire gets the first opportunity to be in there to avoid any contamination. Ensure that everything is documented properly. Consider all your hypotheses and that process of elimination. And now, you know, because we move on and we've looked at all this, we kind of look at all of the patterns that are offered and it's time to put our investigator's hat on. So if you were to look at this one, this picture that's right there, tell me what you see. So you would probably look at this and say, I see a hole in a rubber carpet and it's kind of a, an irregular pattern. So if I were to ask you, is this drop down or is this as a result of an accelerant or is that as a result of suppression activities, then you'd have to kind of look at this and deliberate and look at what surrounds it. Well, I would look above, I certainly would look above to see if there's any curtains or is there anything that could have dropped on there? Was there an object that was on there? I would certainly do my investigation, but through that uh, process of elimination, I would come to the finding that, oops, now I'm looking at possibly forced entry. And in this case, we were finding screws and the door had been replaced and you could not tell that that garage door at the back had been removed. So a police officer during their patrols driving by would have just seen the door standing there, but it didn't take very much once we were inside just to give it a good push and to see that it had fallen over. So you wanna make sure when you're looking at this, do I have any signs of forced entry? So the considerations out of this, okay, you're going to a scene, your expert is gonna probably start to ask questions if there's an alarm system, 
video surveillance, location of origin or nearby, is there any other video surveillance? Often across the street at a gas station, I've gone back to gas stations to look at an approximate time close to the fire and found that people were filling uh, gas containers. Um, you're gonna be looking at your overall physical evidence. Items removed or targeted is important. So you may have, normally you would have pets inside. They may no longer uh, normally that they would be there. They're now staying at somebody else's. You're looking at equipment, filing cabinets, okay? And or uh, family portraits or pictures that are not there. The takeaways out of this, well, you know, financial pressures as a result of COVID-19, we've seen some increase in some areas, unfortunately, and uh, can be a motive and rationalization for fraud. However, okay, when your investigators attend, we've got to make sure that they're completely unbiased, okay, and the methodology is followed, and it's followed the same whether it's commercial or if it's residential. And when in doubt, contact an expert and ask them. So without any further ado, I will introduce you for the uh, second part of this presentation, Mr. Ian Daunt. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining. As a law suggester, I'd like to tell you a story about an arson claim I investigated. In this presentation, I'm going to outline the investigation process and the lessons learned. This will assist you in navigating the challenges of an arson investigation, how you conduct it without prejudice to insurer's liability, yet you do so in an economic fashion, and more importantly, keeping an open mind until the investigation is complete. Now you'll see from this slide, this is a, a commercial fire, the building operated as a pork and meat plant. It had also another tenant who operated as a slaughterhouse for pigs and cattle. And the plant was certified as both Canadian and American uh, CFIA USDA approved. This is the location of the first fire. It was found outside a washroom in the basement. An employee discovered the fire at 3.50 a.m. The fire department attended and extinguished this small fire. Strangely, the fire department did not raise any concerns as to how a fire could start in this location. This was the location of the second fire. After extinguishment of the first fire, the fire department departed. Staff were allowed to enter the building when within about 15 minutes, a second alarm was raised. The second alarm was discovered in a cooler room at the north side of the plant. The fire department reattended, but in this case, the fire had taken hold as there was insulation of cork and foam in the walls and the fire took at least 24 hours to get under control. It was subsequently determined that both fires were entirely separate, there was no link, and they were deliberately set. As part of the investigation, a gas line was found to be disconnected in the boiler room, which was away from both areas of the fire. This is what uh, the meat processing area looked like before the fire. This is what it looked like after the fire. This is the roof after the fire. So what challenges did we have at the scene? Well, we had an Ontario fire marshal and police investigation. We had CFIA involved who had certain demands. We had the Toronto Fire Department or Toronto Health Department. Residents had to be evacuated. The building suffered serious structural damage and there were requests to provide emergency shoring and fencing. And on day three, the police designated the scene a crime scene, and the insured refused to sign the non-waiver. The insured then retained counsel and appointed a cause and origin engineer. The insured reneged on an agreement to pay for the removal of meat. All agencies were looking to pressure insurers to pick up the cost of various uh, work that had to be performed. 
there was a mortgage company involved. Prior to the OFM releasing the scene on day five, they agreed to walk or cause an origin engineer through the scene. However, the insured insisted on being present, uh, which the OFM refused because there was an active police investigation. Uh, and then they simply released the building to the owner. We had some unique coverage issues. We had a landlord, an operating tenant, and the slaughterhouse being involved. We had the mortgage company. The operating tenant was substantially placed in receivership by the bank. And we had issues to determine ownership of leasehold improvements. And we had a BI claim by both the landlord and the receiver. The tenant ultimately retained a public adjuster. There was a proof of loss filed for approximately 9.6 million. There was a claim for both building and equipment damage. The receiver filed a claim for 3.2 million. That included various components. And there was a lawyer for the landlord later claimed for equipment and business interruption. So what lessons did we learn? Well, first of all, it is very important that you interview the insured at the first opportunity. You just don't know what information is going to develop. Fortunately, I took the opportunity to interview the insured son on day one. I took him off to a Starbucks and we sat down for three hours so I could secure some details on the loss. This turned out to be the only opportunity we got to speak to the insured. Uh, it transpired in day three that the police designated the scene as a crime scene but they did not give us any details why they did that. As such, we, were, we provided the insured with a non-waiver agreement, but they refused to sign it. They retained legal counsel, and we never did get the opportunity to interview them or secure any formal statements over the next eight years, which was the life of the file. After the first and only interview, we really had no access to the insured, as all the flow of information was through solicitors. So in summary, very important to get as much information as you can early on, even if you have limited access to the policyholder. Do not wait until you get entry to the building. You can always interview the insured again later to clarify certain facts you have developed. In this case, we did not get access to the building until the end of day five. So if I hadn't interviewed the insured early on, we would never have got any evidence from them at all. In addition, speak to people who arrive at the scene. Early on, I spoke to a representative from a mortgage company who attended, and we succeeded in getting some valuable documents, such as a pre-loss appraisal report and pre-loss photographs. We secured this with the insured's permission early on, but if we had waited, we would have never got this permission with legal counsel involved later. You need to retain the proper investigation team and counsel early on. Uh, it's important to have the right people in place. Remember, you still have to value the loss even as in a suspected arson case. In this case, we retained the following team. Security to protect the scene while we investigated. It's important that security keep a proper log of all persons entering and accessing the site, as Mario referenced earlier. Engineers to identify the structural damage and to define the type of building which existed prior to the fire so you can price what it will cost to repair or rebuild. We retained a roofing consultant to comment on prior deterioration and poor maintenance that we noticed to the roof. We retained environmental to determine what hazards existed at the site. We also retained an equipment expert to tell us whether the equipment could be lubricated to avoid deterioration. We retained a cleaning company and conducted various tests in the building to determine the best method to clean and we retained accountants to verify the inventory and stock. Now, in arson cases, you need to tread very lightly or in suspected arson cases. As mentioned earlier, you need to involve counsel early on if there are any concerns. Note you'll face a lot of pressure at the site from the insured and authorities to pay for things they want done. This includes emergency fencing, hoarding, paying to remove contaminated stock from the building. You'll have to resist this pressure whilst the origin and cause investigation is ongoing. It's particularly difficult to explain to non-insurance people why the insurer doesn't want to pay for the cost of emergency work required at the site. I'll give you an example. 
On day three, I was summoned to a meeting at the command post and told CFIA had condemned the meat in the building. Crawford was told to come back with a plan in two hours to remove around 500 carcasses that weighed 700 pounds each from a building that was structurally damaged. We came up with a plan to remove the stock safely via a rail system, and we then brokered a deal between the insured and a rendering plant we had contacted with the insured agree to pay for the removal of the contaminated meats. We then arranged for accountants to be on hand to count the meat as staff cut it in half before loading it onto trucks. However, the next morning, as we had 10 trucks lined up outside blocking traffic, the insured arrived and said he wasn't paying for it. Overnight, their bank had appointed a receiver who had frozen the insured's assets. It's very important to remember that an insurance policy is a legal contract. Don't forget to use statutory conditions to your advantage. They can back you up when you are faced with a lot of pressure from the insured or the authorities to pay for emergency work that needs to be done. Use these conditions to explain why insurers can make no commitment on coverage until the investigation is complete. Some examples of statutory conditions are number six, which details the requirements the insured needs to follow after a loss, and it's quite detailed as to what they are required to provide. Statutory condition number seven, which is fraud, and it details that coverage is invalidated if there's fraudulent action by the insured or persons acting on their behalf. Statutory condition number 10 details insurers' rights to enter and control the site to conduct an investigation. Uh, even so, we would usually still get written authorization from the insured to attend the site to investigate. And that condition also includes that salvage cannot be abandoned to insurers. And statutory condition number 11 deals with any disputes. So if you get into a dispute on quantum, that is a condition that can be used in order to resolve the dispute. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian and uh, Mario. So we are welcoming questions now. Uh, if you don't mind going into the GoToWebinar uh, little um, portal there on your screen and you can input questions. So the first question I have here is, has there been a marked increase in incendiary fires that could be attributed to the pandemic? It's, it's difficult to, to specifically attribute it to the pandemic. I've noticed uh, from reviewing a lot of the files that come in that there are some that are coming in more so these times, but whether it's because of loss of job or the pandemic, we don't always know the mental state of the people. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult, but definitely the the pandemic, because of the loss of jobs, um, has probably increased uh, the amount and uh, people are, are suffering from anxiety. There's people that are anxious. We see it amongst our families. We see it, you know, throughout. So and unfortunately, yeah. that's reality. You know, I've, I've been hearing from our other forensic experts in various disciplines, not specifically pertaining to fire that they are seeing a lot, a, a huge uptick in suspicious claims. Um, I know I was just speaking with uh, Dina Matei, one of our materials and metallurgical experts who were saying that he's seen more um, suspicious water claims in the past uh, three months than he's seen in the past three years. So um, that's just one example of that uptick. Now, Ian, have you been seeing anything on your end no, but I think you'll probably start seeing it more likely next year when the financial stimulus ends. Yes, a oh, very good point. Great. Okay, next question. I didn't understand the bedroom fire where there was no burn marks in the middle and part of the bed. Mary, I believe that was part of your slides where there was a something like a a piece of fabric or something. That's correct. Uh, what had happened in this case, there was uh, multiple areas of origin. There was some on different floors as well. And 
um, they were all done similarly. And what had happened is they were using uh, bedspreads, they were using comforters, they were using anything that they could put their hands on. And what they had done is they almost used it as a trailer. And essentially what they, what we could see had happened there is that they had poured gasoline along that protected area on the bedspreads that eventually um, when we asked for the uh, fire marshal's report, we knew that they had seized, but they had used the the bedspread to go all along the high uh, the hallway right up to the bed. And when they ignited it, it acted as a as a trailer. But what often people think is that once you ignite it, everything goes. But if you just have surface gasoline and you don't have a lot of oxygen, often your fire will just die down. And when it dies down, you're left with a nice protected area underneath because it didn't burn. So this is what happened. And they were using it as a trailer. So much like the toilet paper incident, you light it at one end and see if what happens at the other end, but they leave before realizing that everything has self-extinguished. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question here. What were the results of the pork plank in, uh, plant investigation? Uh, ultimately, the result was that uh, we were unable to prove exclusive opportunity of the insured. Uh, it was in an area where there were residential homes. Uh, they were not happy that there was a pork and meat plant listening to pigs squealing. Uh, so the building was not, we could not uh, totally confirm the building was secure and rule out that somebody might have broke in and uh, deliberately set these fires. We certainly had uh, serious suspicions about the policyholder, but at the end of the day, based on legal opinion, we were able to prove the three requirements required under the arson triangle to sustain a denial uh, of liability. So the insurers ended up uh, paying claims. Uh, we had to obviously pay the mortgage under the mortgage clause. We had to deal with the receiver under the uh, security and their interest on the policy. And we ended up going to appraisal on the claim with the building owner. Um, and that was eventually resolved at appraisal. And at the appraisal, I could do another presentation on that appraisal because it was quite interesting. Yes, you did uh, talk to me about the appraisal process and, and we'd love to have you join us and, and do a presentation on that because it, it was very, very interesting. I have sure. a, a comment here. I found that the, the, um, the submitter says, I found that even though it be it's believed to be arson, unless you have the smoking gun, so to speak, it's still very difficult to prove and deny the claim. Ian, um, since it's relating to the denial of a claim, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I would agree entirely. Like in this case, uh, clearly there was a fire set as a, uh, outside a washroom and there's nothing that you would say would, you know, naturally cause a fire to initiate there. Uh, there was a fire set in a storage area where there was a high fuel load entirely separate from where the first fire was so essentially our conclusions were the first fire was set it didn't take off uh, they then set the second fire uh, to try and have it take off and then there was that gas line which was found attached in the boiler room uh, the insurance comment was that you know he went into the boiler room and found the line detached um, and frankly if that had worked and with people going back into the building, they could have blown up the building and killed many people. I think that's why the police identified it as a crime scene, but I don't think they uh, could also prove anything because to my knowledge, no criminal charges were laid. So very difficult to sustain an arson denial. Okay, question uh, for Mario. Is there any type of fire ignition fuel that just gets burnt up and used with no trace, or does everything leave some sort, some form of residual trace if intentionally used as an accelerant? Yeah, there's there's some some ignitable liquids that are more difficult to detect than others, um, but when you actually uh, take your samples, you can ask for 
for example, for to detect the ignitable flammable liquids, and the lab will often come back with certain components or some some compounds of that liquid. Um, that's where you know we will get sometimes some mixtures that can be put together. But there are some exotic uh, ignitable liquids that, that are much more difficult. Mary, I've heard about people using uh, bags of potato chips. Have you heard anything of that nature? Well, they won't use the bags themselves uh, unless they just want to sustain a flame. But what will happen is uh, with uh, the oils that are in some of the potato chips, you can uh, actually light. Um, if anybody wants to try that, please do it somewhere where it's safe. But you can take one of your uh, chips and go outside and just ignite it. And what you'll find is that the oils on it will keep a sustained flame so uh, they can be left in certain areas and, uh, and what are, you they wanna... totally, are they totally consumed uh, if used to you like as an accelerant to a fire or would there still be a trace of, of the potato chips well it depends the chip itself if you light the one and you obviously it goes that one would be completely consumed where you get a little bit luckier is when they will pour a bag of them, for example, on a floor mat of a vehicle, and they will light light it. Um, if you're lucky, you will have, let's say, half of them consumed, and it will burn elsewhere, but you'll still have something left, right? Mm -hmm. But as far as an analysis for that, um, you, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to prove that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um... Within the changes of NFPA 921 for the 2020 edition and the removal of cl the classification system, mm -hmm. how will this impact reporting? How will this impact in adjustment? What, what you will find in the, the new uh, NFPA uh, 921 is that you will still get the cause. It just will not be uh, accidental or natural or anything like that, you will actually, the investigators will elaborate on the cause. The only cause that will really be still remaining is the undetermined portion. Anything else, um, the the writer of the report, if you wish, or the author, will be writing it out as to what happened. So if you have a hot surface ignition of uh, combustible liquid or oil, on a cook on a stove, it won't be now classified as accidental. It'll actually be written out. Okay, great, thank you. We're just going to go on for two more minutes. Probably will allow for one more question. Um, we've got so many questions, so we will follow up with everyone who submitted their questions. Um, is the landlord uh, is the landlord's adjuster able to restrict access to a tenant who is leasing a property after a fire? Uh, uh, the, that, go ahead, sorry, Ian, go ahead. Sorry, Mario, if you, uh, sure, I can take that. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I would think the tenant has a right to access the building uh, and particularly the space that he occupies. Uh, that would be in my mind after the scene has been returned by the authorities back to the insured. Uh, frankly, insurers have access to the building based on um, conditions in the policy uh, to do an investigation, but you can't, in my opinion, bar an insured or someone who's legally uh, entitled to be in the building from going into the space that they occupy, provided the authorities have no issue uh, that it's uh, safe. Um, obviously, if it's in an area of origin, uh, we would be encouraging that party to stay away from that area until we could conduct the origin and cause investigation so that there was no spoliation of evidence. Uh, and at that stage, I think we would uh, escort them in with security to get areas that they want to do, get to just so we could see what was going on and, and control it better. But I don't think we can deny anyone who rightfully rents a building from accessing that space. I concur with that answer. Great, thank you so much, um, Mario and Ian for joining us today and presenting.
Um, that concludes this session. We will be starting the next session in six minutes, so we'll have a, a very brief break. Anyone that submitted questions that we didn't get to, we promise to uh, get to them within the next day or two. But uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Delorm and Ian Daunt for, for presenting, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you all. Bye. Goodbye. For anyone joining in on the next session, you don't have to drop off. Uh, you can hold on here and we're just going to commence in five minutes. Hey, Michelle and Andrew, can I get a quick uh, sound check for you guys? Hey, George, how you doing? I am doing well. How are you? Good, good. I've been listening in. This has been great. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew, for tuning in. You're uh, crystal clear. Perfect. George, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Perfect. You sound great. All Thank right, you. guys, we'll, we'll be starting in three minutes. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Andrew. <laughs> you guys can mute yourselves if you want, uh, just uh, for the background information, uh, background sound, but uh, you can unmute when when we pass off the mic. <laughs> 